I'm Perry M. Boring. I am the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we actually launched four years ago in this exact venue, so this is a place that's near and dear um, to my heart. Um, so we launched on July 19th of 2014. Um, today we're going to talk about monetary systems, past, present, and future. Um, I am a native Floridian and I lived through the housing collapse in Florida, which was really devastating to my family and my community. Um, it's really economics and public policy that led me to blockchain and Bitcoin, um, and it's what really drives me to do the work that I do. So I'm going to nerd out a little bit if that's okay. So the current international currency system is a product of the past. Hu Jintao, the former president of the People's Republic of China, was well aware that money has evolved rapidly over the past several decades. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are inherent weaknesses still in our current monetary system. Much of that was exposed in 2007. Um, and since then, there's really been little done to reinstate stability and transparency into the global financial system. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto also noted this in the Bitcoin white paper. So the word economy is derived from the word economia, which roughly translates into household management. Um, Ludwig von Mises, who is the father of the Austrian School of Economics, he calls it human action. Um, to me, uh, economics is all about human behavior, um, is an ecosystem, if you will, um, is why we would purchase one product over the another, why we, we would live in the state of Florida versus the state of Illinois, um, why we would send our children to public or to private schools, all these interactions that we have in our life and in business. Um, economics, it's the law of human action and social cooperation of all human decisions. It's the law of mankind's destiny and evolution. And currency is the lifeblood of the economy. Um, it is what delivers substance and nutrients throughout the economy. It's what we use to purchase things that we desire. Money is how we measure everything in our economy. It's what we use to determine the value of our time, our goods, and our services. It's very similar, and it serves the same purpose as a meter serves to measure the length of a football field, or how a kilogram is used to define mass, or the Kelvin is used to define temperature. Money must be stable for an economy to function, and a healthy economy requires a healthy currency, and it's in all of our best interest to have a healthy monetary system. So Aristotle was the protege of Plato, and he was also the tutor to Alexander the Great. He lived around 300 BC, and his classical thinking dominated the world of the mind for almost 2,000 years. Um, he defined money and the characteristics of money that it must be durable, programmable, or portable, divisible, and have intrinsic value. The world largely operated on a gold and or a silver standard um, for thousands of years, civilization naturally flocked to these commodities as money. With the breakdown of the Britain Wood system in the 1970s, which really was not that long ago if you think about it, um, that led to a historic monetary shift away from a gold standard um, to floating fiat money. Uh, fiat meaning that the control of the dollar is by fiat, um, rather than by reference to any type of market signals that are defined by the price of gold. Um, today, the modern characteristics are a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. Um, Sir Isaac Newton, who was the inventor of the Royal Mint, or the master of the Royal Mint, and he was the inventor of the gold standard, um, he was asked by uh, British Treasury officials why the pound had to be fixed to a quantity of precious metal. And this was his response. He said, paper currency cannot be described mathematically as money. Um, a dollar is a certain weight of gold. It's a mathematical description. It is a measurement by weight. All right, if I can get the clicker to work. And this brings us to the blockchain. So as stated by Christine Lagarde, she's the managing director of the IMF, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies just might give existing currency and monetary policy a run for their money. So cryptocurrencies are restoring math and science 
back into monetary policy. Bitcoin has been described as digital gold and gold 2.0 because it has all of the characteristics of gold, including durability, portability, and it's divisible. Plus it has other technolo um, advanced technology features like immutability, the ability to be programmed and verified, and it's easy to store in very large quantities. So very different than carrying around heavy bricks of gold everywhere. So will the blockchain transform the world's monetary system? Um, this is a very tall order, but I believe it's something worth fighting for. Um, as I stated earlier, we all have one important thing in common, that we all benefit from having a strong and a healthy monetary system. Our incentives here are aligned. Um, I am persuaded and I've proclaimed many times that I believe the blockchain will prove to be more value, valuable than electricity. Uh, the chamber, um, the members of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, they recognize this, and they're innovating with blockchain um, through all levels of business, government, and society. Um, everything from supply chains, using blockchain to create a self-sovereign identity, a true digital identity, smart contracts, and much, much more. Um, we represent over 160 companies globally who are all investing in and innovating with blockchain-based technologies. This is a small sampling of the members. The full list is on our website. Um, but we are proud to have a very strong um, Illinois constituency, including Block, the CME Group, CMT Digital, Discover, Wifley, and many others. So the Chamber of Digital Commerce, if you're not familiar with us, um, is the world's largest trade association representing the blockchain technology industry. Um, our mission is to promote the acceptance and use of digital assets and blockchain-based technologies. And we do this through education, advocacy, working closely with policymakers, regulatory agencies, and the industry. And our goal is to develop an environment that fosters job, innovation, and investment. Um, in order for business and humanity to realize the potential benefits of blockchain, we need a regulatory framework that supports innovation. Um, at the Chamber, we believe that government and regulation is one of the biggest risks to the mass adoption of blockchain. Um, so the following are a few of the top policy issues that we're working on today at the Chamber. One, um, distributed tokens and ICOs. Um, so if you guys have been paying attention to anything over the past year, um, you would <laughs> realize that there is significant activity underway around token issuances and initial coin offerings. Some of this activity is very exciting, it's technology forward, but at the same time, there are bad actors out there um, that are issuing tokens under fraudulent pretenses. Um, this is concerning, and as a community, we should be doing everything we can to curb illicit use of this powerful tool. It makes our job at the chamber a lot harder. Um, in addition, there's also much regulatory uncertainty around tokens and their regulatory environment. So the concept of what is a security and a tokenized ecosystem is not clear, um, and there is no guidance on how to issue or operate a non-security token in any form. Um, in fact, talking to a lot of the lawyers that we work with who are practicing and advising in this space, what I'm hearing now is that they're saying if you want to issue a token, just don't open it up to U.S. investors at all, um, which is concerning and sad. Um, so in response, we have formed the Token Alliance um, to draft um, best practices and principles uh, for the issuance of tokens. Uh, their respective trading platforms, and then the relationship between a token issuer and a trading platform. Um, we believe that it's the industry and it, that knows this technology best, um, that's best suited to address these types of challenges during the early days in blockchain's development. So our token um, guidelines are being drafted with the input of over 300 people around the world. We've recruited token issuer, uh, issuers, uh, technologists, uh, lawyers and former public policy makers, and we've recruited um, Dr. Jim Newsom, who's the former chairman of the CFTC. He was also the former CEO of NYMEX. He merged it with the, what is now the CME, um, and now he's um, working with us in DC. Um, and Paul Atkins is our other co-chair. He's the former commissioner at the SEC. So we've recruited former policy makers to help advise us and our members to help draft these best practices. 
Um, we believe that writing best practices is the responsible thing to do. Every industry in the world has standards, guidelines, best practices. We need it too. Um, we're being proactive with this, and we are confident that we will get a much better outcome um, through this process, an industry-led process, than waiting on the government to react. So issue number two, um, tax. We just had tax day last week, so I'm sure you guys are all aware that the taxation around cryptocurrencies, virtual currencies, digital assets, um, is what I call crazy and cruel. So just to walk us through the story of how we got to where we are today, um, in 2014, the IRS issued guidance that convertible virtual currencies would be taxed as property. So the IRS is underneath the US Department of the Treasury, as is FinCEN. So the year before that, FinCEN issued guidance as well, saying that they were going to regulate this exact same technology as currency. So you have one side of Treasury saying we're going to regulate it as currency, and then the IRS saying it's going to be taxed as property. So that subjected Bitcoin and any other virtual currencies or crypto assets to be taxed at the transaction level, um, which means every single time a token or a Bitcoin or a digital currency is sent or spent on a blockchain, the user has to also calculate a mathematical formula and then guess what their tax liability is. So they're subject to the capital gains and investment income tax. Um, we call this crazy and cruel because the IRS's own inspector general um, issued a report criticizing the IRS's compliance program. So when the IRS put out their guidance in 2014, they also solicited comments from the public, which is a pretty natural um, and regular um, regulatory and public policy process where an agency or a regulatory division will issue guidance or draft guidance. They solicit comments from the public and they use that for the, the actual final piece of guidance. So they selected hundreds of comments. Um, a lot of people asked, a lot of reasonable questions, like are we supposed to use LIFO, last in, first out, or FIFO, first in, first out, to calculate your capital gains? We actually still don't know that, but a very fair question to ask. Another question that was raised is, well, what exchange rate are you supposed to use? Are you supposed to use the exchange that you bought the Bitcoin on, but what if you got your crypto from another exchange? Are you supposed to average the exchanges? Because there is no set price for any crypto today. So again, another fair question to ask zero response from the IRS. Um, so this is what the Inspector General um, of the, the Treasury um, talked about in their report. Um, and that was in 2006. And the IRS still has not answered any of these questions. Um, instead, they issued a John Doe summons on Coinbase. So I am a big believer that our tax issues is one of the biggest barriers to adoption um, because of the administrative nightmare that it subjects everyone that wants to use this technology to. Um, in order to fix this challenge, we spent a lot of time coming up with a new and proposing a new tax policy um, for the United States, and it's very simple. Um, we believe that digital assets, digital currencies, should be taxed as an alternative to the U.S. dollar. So it's obviously not the U.S. dollar. It's not backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. It's not even associated with the government in any way, shape, or form. But it should be an alternative. It should be taxed as an alternative to the U.S. dollar. And this would be very easy to, to achieve if we simply exempt, exempted crypto assets from the capital gains and investment income tax. It was a very simple fix to do. Um, this is our position, and this is what we're advocating for in Washington, D.C. And the third issue that I'm going to talk about today is smart contracts. So smart contracts are incredibly important in financial services. They have the potential to drastically reduce paper-based systems and radically improve the way we conduct business today. So we developed the Smart Contracts Alliance to promote the understanding and adoption of smart contracts globally. Um, and we are running into a potential risk um, here in the United States. Um, so there are states who are amending their state uniform electronic transactions acts. I know I'm getting into the weeds here, um, but I have um, handouts for you as well. Um, states including Arizona, California, Nevada, Tennessee, and others have issued legislation doing exactly this. Um, and we argue that that can cause a lot of confusion in the markets because there's other laws, ESIGN and UEDA, that already provide an unquestionable legal basis for smart contracts technology executing the terms of a legal contract, and they do not need to be amended. So Tom Gonser, who's the founder of DocuSign, he um, explained the issue this way. So rather than a business consulting the ESIGN Act or UEDA, can you imagine having to look at every single state's smart contracts legislation and then comparing it to 
e-sign and that state's UEDA legislation, and then ensuring that there's no, caps and go, uh, no gaps or conflicts in any particular form of smart contract that's covered by the law. So what is potentially happening here is we're taking smart contracts and pushing it into a state patchwork. So exchanges, money service businesses, MSBs know how much of an onerous, burdensome, expensive process it is to have a state-by-state -state regime. This is what's potentially happening in smart contracts. We have a federal law that covers smart contracts. We want to keep that, and we don't want to confuse that. So how can you help? or what can you do to assist in the policy process? So um, we passed out these letters. Um, we have formed a coalition with the Electronic Signatures and Records Association. Um, we're educating state lawmakers, helping them really understand what's happening, what the potential risk of this types of legislation is. Um, and then we're just asking the community to support this effort by signing this letter. Um, so Andrea from the Chambers team is back here at the table right next to OTCXN. Um, and you can either sign this and just hand it to Andrea, um, or she has an iPad and you can sign um, digitally. Um, you can also show your support for the chamber by joining, um, by joining our membership. Um, so we are a nonprofit organization and we rely on membership dues to fund our operations. Um, you can join the chamber today and be a part of a unified voice that is advocating for the blockchain sector. As a former congressional staffer, I can tell you it's incredibly important to have a dedicated organization, advocate, and resources in DC to work with the policy community to help guide them in their understanding of this technology frontier. So four years ago, when I was here and we launched the chamber, um, we had a senator that called for a ban on Bitcoin. There were lots of hearings on Capitol Hill talking about the dangers of this technology, and agencies were issuing warnings about how dangerous Bitcoin and other virtual currencies potentially can be. Um, in just f four short years, we've gone from that type of environment where the only thing people in D.C. knew about Bitcoin is that people were using it either to buy illegal drugs on Silk Road or they knew about Mt. Gox. Today, we've really transformed that dialogue into having actual advocates within government. So we have a congressional blockchain caucus in Congress. So we went from having members saying we should ban Bitcoin to having a blockchain caucus, which is a big difference. Um, and we also have advocates all throughout the agencies. Um, the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Christopher Giancarlo, is one of the biggest outspoken advocates for our community. He has said that blockchain technology is in um, the national interest of the United States of America. Um, the community has called, has renamed him Crypto Daddy. So <laughs> he's one of the, the people we've helped recruit and educate um, and become an advocate for us um, within the DC community. Um, so if you have any questions about our smart contracts letter, you can visit our website. We have some additional memos and educational materials um, explaining the issue in more detail, or you can always set up a time to speak with someone from our policy team to walk you through it. Um, this is by no means everything that we cover at the Chamber. We have a very prolific platform underway. We cover is other issues including accounting, AML, illicit finance. We have a state working group um, and others. Um, and our key mission and job is to serve as a dedicated resource to the policy community in Washington, D.C. and beyond. Uh, so to learn more, you can visit our website at digitalchamber.org um, or you can visit or you can email us info at Digital Chamber. Um, and we'll be at the table in the back collecting signatures if you'd like to join our campaign. Thanks. Thanks, Perianne.